it's so good to see each of you. Thanks for um, uh, joining us for about 45 minutes on this movement.org update. Um, I'm Craig and I serve along with our team and we're delighted to have some of our team here. And over these last three days, we've been actually in conversation with quite a number of cities. And it's interesting because the world is moving towards cities. I was researching earlier today, Mar Marlon, about uh, Lancaster City and how it's growing. Uh, in fact, the majority of the world's population lives in cities. And in, uh, in 30 years, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. So as we look across the world, we're saying the mission field today is really the city. That's the mission field. And our mission at movement.org is to catalyze leaders to spiritually and socially impact their cities. Here it comes up on the screen. And our vision is that every global city is flourishing both spiritually and socially. So to just set a framework for our conversation, let's just uh, watch this very short video clip. Cities can be quite brutal places, actually. It's appalling some of the stuff we're having to deal with. Almost every city has a significant population of people that are living below the poverty line. Some of the common factors would be disease, uh, HIV, AIDS, fatherlessness, orphans, sex trafficking, injustice. We've devolved into divisions. A huge divide between the mainline churches and the small churches. The challenge for us is how do we bring them together? Cities around the world are growing at staggering rates. And even before the COVID-19 pandemic and recent racial protests, every city already had critical social, economic and spiritual issues. Now, add to that the mountain of recovery from job losses, bereavement and mental health issues. In many of these same cities, the gospel is suppressed. Christians are being persecuted. Churches are closing and unprecedented numbers of young people are leaving the church and disaffiliating with Christianity. The only way to address these crippling challenges is through collaboration, cooperation and prayer. But unfortunately, cities have never been more deeply fragmented. And churches, nonprofits, marketplace leaders and city governments tend to work in silos. There has to be change. There has to be unity, and there can be, but the church must lead this effort. Join us and leaders from around the world in this movement. So Corinne asked the question, how, how, how do we bring the body of Christ together in cities? And, and we believe that something uniquely and powerfully happens when, when leaders link arms together, when leaders from commerce, and a number of you are that, when leaders from church, when leaders from the community of nonprofits, when they link arms together, and then they bring civic leaders to the table and they say, what are the stubborn realities of our city? Then they grab hold of a 10-year vision for their city and they say, we are going to move the needle on these stubborn realities. We call that a city movement. And today, through relationships around the world, Movement.org serves 200 cities and six continents. We sat with some of our global leaders and they said, we believe it should be a thousand cities that we're connected with by 2030. We don't own them. We resource them, we connect them, and we empower them. In fact, on Wednesday, we had, some of us were on this Zoom, we had 300 leaders from across the world saying, how do we pray for the fragile cities of the world? One business friend texted me right at the end and he said in just one word, powerful. Part of the reason they're fragile is because of COVID-19 and it has hit as kind of ravaged around the world. At the same time, it's ratcheted up and accelerated what we do as a ministry. There's a hunger for unity today like there hasn't been in decades. And you'll hear one of our team members say city movements have accelerated 10 years worth in three months. What we're inviting you to be a part of is this collaboration of business leaders who bring your experience and your wisdom and in your acumen to this moment, this accelerating moment. Now, you're gonna hear some terms over the next few minutes. You'll hear movement.org, that's our organization that serves city movements. You'll hear Movement Day, that's a city's annual gathering that accelerates the movement. And you'll hear Lead NYC, that's our New York City city movement that we give leadership to. 
Mac is our founder. Um, Mac was the one that God used to really help set this in motion. And Mac, I wonder if you'd speak both to the birth of movement.org, but as significantly, the collaboration and convening that really makes a difference in a city. Almost all of you on the screen have been such an important part of our 10-year journey. And I want to just say a few words about our vision that we collectively can have a legacy, I believe, to impact a thousand cities over the next decade. In the last 35 years in New York City, we have convened 250,000 people to pray with and for the city. In the last 10 years, we have convened 40,000 leaders from 400 cities to engage their city through Movement Day. How did we get here? In 1988, in New York City, the city was very poor, the city was very violent, and there was an enormous amount of unrest. Against that backdrop, we were collaborating with a group called Here's Life Inner City. We invited 16 churches to come pray together on a Friday night. And on that Friday night, we had 75 churches that showed up at my church in Flushing, Queens. Over the last 30 years, we've seen 2,000 churches participate in this prayer movement. For that 13-year period from 1988 to 2001, we continued to pray together. And that praying together built the muscle of trust that allowed us to begin to dream big dreams. On September 11th, uh, we saw 3,000 New Yorkers die in a single day. It was the largest loss of life on American soil in American history. Coming out of 9-11, because we had been praying together for 13 years, we took on big ideas. We began to serve the poor, we began to train leaders, and we began to plant churches. Uh, Tim Keller arrived in New York in the late 1980s, and in the year 2000, Tim asked me to co-create with him the Church Multiplication Alliance. We believe that churches 10 years and younger are eight times more effective reaching new people. We worked on this initiative for the next eight years, and then we decided to commission the research to evaluate the progress of that initiative. In 2009, we discovered that evangelical Christianity had grown 300% in 20 years from 1989 to 2009. We had 30,000 people worshiping in Manhattan in 2009 that were not worshiping in 1989. That research gave us the foundation for the very first movement gathering, Movement Day gathering 10 years ago in Manhattan. Movement Day is such a powerful idea that the first gathering 10 years ago convened leaders from 34 states and 14 countries. And over the last 10 years, we've convened 40,000 leaders from 400 cities. New York continues to be the epicenter of the city gospel movement. New York is to the 21st century what Jerusalem was to the first century church. New York continues to model for the world what it means uh, to make an enormous difference. This last January, we finished our 30th consecutive pastor's prayer summit. Uh, it's the largest, longest running, and most diverse gathering of its kind in the country. Uh, it is skillfully and wonderfully led by the executive director of Lead NYC, Adam Durso, who, in my opinion, has really emerged as one of the most important leaders in New York in the last 50 years. I'm gonna invite Adam to share a little bit of what's happening in New York because it continues to be the epicenter of the city gospel movement around the world. Thanks, Mac. I mean, the truth of the matter is, Lead NYC stands on the shoulders of the 30-year prayer movement that Mac founded, the Pastors Prayer Summit, the 250 plus pastors that got away to pray together this past January, Movement Day NYC that some of you have attended, uh, DG attended last year. Tim Keller called it the most important Christian event in New York City annually. Uh, creating space for pastors across denominational, cultural, and racial lines is more important now than ever before. Pastor A.R. Bernard, the pastor of the Christian Cultural Center, which is the largest church in New York City with 46,000 members, just said recently, it is so vital that as pastors and leaders, we have a space to build trust Pray together and conduct difficult conversations. Lead NYC has done just that. Our training platform is advanced leadership intensive. This month in June, we graduated our 10th cohort, training senior ministry leaders and senior uh, nonprofit leaders. It's up to date in the last 10 years, total of 550 alumni have gone through the program, 
creating a strategic plan for their ministry, and right now impacting 5.9 million metropolitan New Yorkers. Anthony Lemke, who's a, a champion for ALI, said it's the best ROI. Uh, I'm sorry, Anthony Lemke, who's a uh, champion for ALI, said that it's the best ROI in training leaders in New York City. These are difficult days, but the work of Lead NYC is more vital than ever. Since COVID-19, really the, at the underbelly of what's happened, students have been disproportionately impacted. We know from our work with Charlene McRae, the first lady of New York City, that abuse has gone way up, especially in the fragile zip codes we've already been working in. Emotional, physical, and verbal abuse has increased in those areas. The education inequality gap has widened. We know that because students that are in more fragile areas have lack of high-speed Wi-Fi, laptops, and iPads. Some teachers have told us that a class of 35 students only has three or four students showing up to class each day. There's trauma involved post-COVID, and food deserts have widened. The truth of the matter is many of our students rely on breakfast and free lunch at school and have not had, had access to them in months now. Mayor Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City, just released this statement about LEAD NYC. He said, rebuilding in the wake of COVID-19 will require an unprecedented amount of coordination between stakeholders, especially in the areas hardest hit by the virus. And organizations like LEAD NYC and leaders like Adam Derso will help to guide us forward across New York City in these efforts. The work of LEAD NYC has expanded and it's more vital now than it has ever been before. Bob Dahl, who's chief equity strategist at Nuveen, I'm not sure that I've ever been compared to McDonald's before, but he said this recently in a quote, LEAD NYC has created the proverbial secret sauce. Well, I'm excited to be leading in New York because I believe that these are unprecedented days, not just unprecedented by the trauma and by the drastic nature of what's going on, but unprecedented for the impact of the potential of the gospel. My friend Jim Liskey, who's on this call, who's leading U.S. city leaders, has been helping take the model of what New York City is and expanding it to 50 cities across the U.S. and then giving guidance and input to six continents around the globe. Jim, I'm going to toss it to you so that you can be able to share, my friend. Hey, Adam, thank you. And thanks for all you're doing in New York, because what you're doing in New York is creating the model for the U.S. and the globe. And uh, Jeff Elhart, keep that, uh, keep that boat shined up that you're sitting on right now in Lake Mack, because uh, Adam Dorso is on his way to uh, Southwest Michigan here in August. And I promised him a boat ride, Jeff. So you're going to have to get him out on the big lake. If Come on, buddy. So that there we go. So I, uh, I, we are so thrilled with uh, how God is, is, is really, during the time of COVID and now racial unrest, is really using uh, movement.org and the U.S. City Movement to, to become the delivery system for uh, uh, what is really an emerging sense of the gospel coming to bear on cities across our country. Since 2022, the movement.org USA family has grown from 10 to 50 cities. Uh, we uh, are planning on working on a 50-city delivery system for spiritual and social flourishing. Uh, during uh, this time of COVID, we've been connecting with 100 cities on a weekly basis. Uh, we started a weekly call thinking that our city leaders would want to get together to talk about best practices. <clears throat> we had no idea of the hunger that was out there. City leaders sit in this neutral, convening place of being able to bring the church, the community, um, civic government and commerce together to solve the big problems. And we've been able to provide expert guidance on leading in the midst of COVID and, and what it meant to, for some of our city leaders to sit next to the mayor of their city, to become the convener of the volunteers and raising up food distribution. And, and in the city of Houston, giving out hundreds of thousands of masks to particularly people on the margins. In that in the time we've moved into now with racial unrest, people like Claude Alexander and Clarence Hill and, and here in the future, A.R. Bernard and, and Reverend Ireland from New York, talking to our city leaders about how do we have these conversations around um, being able to move the needle forward in the, on this racial issue that can truly bring healing across our country. In one city, in the city of Tucson, moving into the issues that we uh, entered into in March, 
um, they had already built a collaborative of 19 agencies, the state, the local government, businesses, to reduce poverty by 3%. Moving then into COVID, the delivery system they've been able to develop is now emerging into a pilot with a, a national foundation to actually deliver cohort-based, digitally-based, post-high high school education to those emerging out of poverty. It will be the only one like it in the country, and the cohorts are going to meet in church buildings available space. We see globally we've moved from one regional hub with one city in six years to 200 cities and seven global and, and seven global um, hubs that we have that we're working on. One example is Port Moresby. I was there last November. It is the most dangerous city to live in in the world if you're a woman or a girl. The president of Papua New Guinea, the mayor, the colonel of the army, local businesses, a unified church have come together and they, <clears throat> and they said no more. Our city will not be known for this type of violence towards women. God is opening the doors, throwing them open now to Latin America. Uh, Movemento.org is uh, beginning to emerge as uh, we start looking at how do we help? What do we do? Cities are asking us to come and help them create social and spiritual flourishing throughout Central, South America, and the Caribbean. God is moving tremendously around the globe because New York has emerged as a model. The U.S. is beginning to emerge as a model, and now we get to help the globe. We're going to go now to India, and uh, this is the one person that none of us want to follow on any call, Mark Visvasam, uh, one of my spiritual heroes. He's going to tell us about the speed of the gospel and city movements across India. Mark, th thanks so much for uh, taking a few minutes to have this conversation. And I know you live in Chennai, India. You've been involved in city movements for more than a decade. H how is the power of convening church leaders and nonprofit leaders and business leaders making, actually making a difference in a city, say like Chennai, where you live? Let me start with one leader, a marketplace leader named Max. Max works for a very large company. He has 45 stores that he's the operations manager. Max, when he came to Movement Day, he really got the thrill of planting churches, which he had never done. And then within the first year, he planted three churches among the young people. Then last year, he planted two more. And he told me just a week ago, he wants to plant five more by next year. So what a Movement Day really does, inspires and excites the young leaders, the senior leaders to go and do something the city has not done before. So how have you seen silos kind of break down in a city because we're so busy about our individual churches to really wrap their arms collaboratively around what a city needs? Chennai needed churches among the migrant workers. We had 1.5 million non-residents coming into our city in the last few years. So Movement Day gave an opportunity for the Chennai churches to get something started among the Hindi-speaking non-resident you know, Chennaiites, mm -hmm. are, are not the Indian migrants. Now, we, we could say 45 new churches have been planted already. That's because all those who really wanted to do this work together are coming together regularly, pray and support one another, and we could see a great movement of church planting there. That's fantastic. You also talked with me at one point about children's ministries coming together across the city. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, in 2006, when Movement Day, uh, when CTN, Chennai Transformation Network, uh, started, we realized that Chennai has a really large number of children, but they're not reached. So we began bringing together under the transformation uh, among the children's ministries, uh, the network of children's ministries. Now, 36 organizations have come together and they share their resources. They could reach to 100,000 children every okay. year. That's because they're able to share all their resources with one another. Wow. Now, I know, Mark, we, uh, often in the West, we know of Calcutta because of Mother Teresa's story. You travel all the way over to Calcutta. Give us, uh, we just have a couple minutes, the size of the city and kind of what's stirring there as churches are having conversation together. Calcutta is really good at bringing transformation work into the slums, but what we recognized was that there was not enough churches in Calcutta. A city of 18 million, it's unimaginable for me to see only 300 churches. Hmm. 
and each church is averaging just 50 people. Very few people in that city who are believers. So our movement day, just about a year, about a year ago, really emphasized the need for taking the gospel to the whole city by all the churches and plant new churches. And already we have seen in the, just in the last three or four months, six new churches come up. So we are now going towards 1,000 churches mm. that this Calcutta city would have. So we'll have a critical number of churches that can take over the whole city. So these are, are pastors and leaders of a variety of denominations who are committing together to see that happen. Oh, exactly. We have the Baptist, we have the Anglican, we have the Assembly of God, we have every type of Pentecostal church and traditional church coming together. That's fantastic. Uh, in, in the last minute, kind of give your vision for city movements across India and how it can make a difference. What really we are thinking now is to divide India into five regions, south, north, east, west, and central. Each region has about 100 churches. So we have 500 churches, um, 500 cities in India. And so our desire is to develop a team for each region so that they will go after those 100 churches and at least in 10 of them. That means collectively in India in the next five years, we want to see 50 movement day gatherings happen every year, if not every two years. Uh, Mark, we pray for you frequently, in fact, daily, uh, because uh, you face an environment that's many times hostile to the gospel. Thank you for leading the way in what it means for the body of Christ to work together in a city for the advancement of the kingdom. Bless you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for your support. I'm sure we can go much, much far if we can join hands together. So the same day, uh, 5,000 miles away from India, I had a conversation with Roger Sutton, who leads uh, movement.org, Movement Day in the UK and in Europe. So let's chat with Roger for a few minutes. Roger, I, re I really appreciate you taking the time for this, uh, this chat. You've been involved in city movements uh, in the UK. You live in Manchester. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you see the impact of city movements being on specific cities across the UK. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Uh, greetings from the UK. Um, yeah, our city movements have just been absolutely pivotal in uh, delivering um, some incredible ministry across our cities and our towns. Um, over the last 25 years, God has been bringing pastors together, leaders in Christian organizations, people in business, arts, education, together to actually make a difference for their places. And um, I think really what it's doing is, rather than everyone doing their own thing, rather than everyone in a silo mentality where, you know, my denomination does this, or my church does this, or my organization does this, um, that coming together, um, which, is, which to me is around strategy and coordination. Um, what is the job we have to do? Well, the job we have to do is, is to evangelize our cities, is to um, provide social care for our cities, is to increase the, the values of the kingdom of God in our cities. That's what we want. We want to see transformed cities. And you can only do that. That's a big job, you see. You can only do that if you work together. Um, the body of Christ, when it comes together as one, one unit, is a powerful thing. In our country, um, it's churches who provide most of the youth work. They provide the food banks. They provide the elderly care. They provide um, care for young people, uh, for people in debt. Now, when you bring that together and you become a force and a, an entity for good in the city, and it's produced some incredible stuff. Um, you know, I, I can take you to cities around this country where there is just such joined up working um, in places like Lincoln and Nottingham, which are old cities, actually. Um, they brought together all the Christians involved in social action and they are they're formulating a plan going forward for their cities hmm. so that they work together. Interestingly, in the recovery now, as we are now entering the recovery phase of COVID, um, what we're finding is that those, those cities which were organized, um, they were coordinated and were able to be strategic, have responded to the COVID situation like uh, nothing before, because they already had the infrastructure to actually enable that to happen. Right. And you see in a crisis, um, when, you know, I just said there's been an earthquake up across a place. What you don't need is everybody doing their own thing. You need people to work together. You get this actually situations in the developing world where there is a natural disaster and aid agencies move in. But if there's no coordination, you'll get duplication and you'll get gaps. 
um, huge gaps of, of, of ministry that needs to be done that isn't being done because nobody's talking to anybody else. So I think that building, that, that building infrastructure together is absolutely vital as we move forward. We've been seeing it across our cities. Um, we've had our public services saying to some of our city networks, could you set up the bereavement service for us? You know, we, we've lost 45,000 people through mm -hmm. this um, ep epidemic and uh, um, it's been devastating for us as I know it is for you in the USA. Um, so they, the council themselves, the, the civic authorities them, uh, themselves have come to the city and said, could you help us with this? Could you help us with this? Um, in Bristol, they're, they're helping feed people. Um, in Teesside, um, again, a, a lot of the food provision coming out of this crisis has been done by the churches. But the issue is, you see, who, who did that council, that civic authority, connect with? Um, what they can't do is connect with 150 churches or 2,000 churches, but they just had to ring one phone number because it was on one website because the churches were together. Mm -hmm. It changes the, the, the yeah. landscape of how people can react. That's fantastic. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, business leaders, they're a part of that collaboration too. I know you have a business call. We have about one minute. Uh, just talk about that business call and the number of people and number of cities represented in that and why that's so significant. Yeah, we got business leaders coming from uh, probably over 50 cities um, from around the country to ask the question, what is the role of business alongside the church and alongside Christian uh, charities can play in the recovery of our land? That's, that's the question. The question isn't just how my business can recover. The question is how can my city recover? Because if my city recovers, my business recovers anyway. And in Jeremiah, of course, it says, bless the city. And if you bless it, if it prospers, you will prosper. So business is absolutely crucial to this. That's great, Roger. Roger, I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Thanks for what you're doing on behalf of the kingdom. Thank you. God bless. I'm, re I'm really glad Ram's here. Ram's on the Zoom today. Uh, Ram, you're home based in, in London, Wimbledon, actually. So in about two minutes, can you just share why you're engaged with movement.org and, and why our mission really matters to you? Sure. Uh, two, uh, uh, ten years ago, which is uh, when I was in New York, uh, invited by Mac and by Bob uh, to attend a movement day, uh, I'd heard in Bangalore about this amazing goings on where in Manhattan church attendance had gone up 300%. I was intrigued. And when I attended that Movement Day event, I could see for the first time as a believer the church, uh, Wall Street, uh, representatives from the mayor's office, community leaders coming together in a way I hadn't seen before. And as chairman of the Lausanne board, my mind immediately said, why is this not in the other cities where Lausanne operates? So talking to Mac and Craig and Bob, they, they began a series of conversation with leaders, Santo Shetty, uh, uh, Gulkir Palani, um, and, and a whole range of people in different cities where Mac started conversing. And I started explaining to them in this way. I said, what we have seen in New York is a laboratory. In that laboratory, something exciting has happened a 300% church growth. I know the figure is much more now, and it's not surprising. And I said, in that laboratory, I can put it in today's terms, a vaccine is being developed, and the catalyst that is going to help the global church and cities fight this pandemic of church decline. And that is really uh, what, what I could see in today's terms. And, I, and, and, and really what we have here is the potential for church growth when people say, the church is in decline. Well, here is something that demonstrates it is not a one-way downward spiral. Things can shift upwards and where more challenging than in Manhattan. Now, it can happen in the city of London and, and, and we've heard from Roger what's been going on in the UK. It can happen in Delhi, in, 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 I mean, across the globe. So the potential is huge. And when business leaders, church leaders, and the, uh, uh, the, the political forces come together, nothing is going to stop them because God's Holy Spirit is really going to take that combination of a humble servant leadership coming together, putting down their differences, putting down any egos and saying, what can we do for the kingdom? Well, we've seen it happen. It isn't just talk. Even today's call and hearing what I heard in the last 40 minutes, wow, <laughs> my max picture of a thousand cities, it can happen. It can be done. It will happen. Go back to you, Craig. <laughs> there is this urgency 
uh, kind of in this moment of time for followers of Jesus in a city, wherever that city is, to dream and think and act collaboratively in a sustained way for decadal impact. And that's true from what Jim said, from Papua New Guinea to Chennai, India, to Durban, South Africa, to Manchester, England, to Athens, Greece, to Toronto, Canada, to Charlotte, North Carolina, to wherever each of us lives. It's, it's a unique moment. And it's often the case that church and nonprofit leaders, those two groups, get together in a city and they sit around a table and they dream and they plan and they strategize. And then they get up and they turn away from the table to a business leader and they say, now, will you pay for this plan? And it's, I mean, it's true that funding a ministry is really important, but what we would really love for you is to be involved at the table, what I call the IAD and strategy table for the global movement and for your city. And we're going to be creating that kind of table in the next uh, couple of months and would love for you to be a part of that idea and strategy table. I mean, certainly, uh, we, like other ministries, uh, are, a, are a ministry that requires funding. We have a unique matching gift that's right in front of us these days. We'll make you aware of that. But we really would invite you to the idea and strategy table. Jim mentioned scaling as we see God just spread this around the world. And I'm just so grateful that you joined us this afternoon. Scott, For thank you for joining in with us. What I'd like to do is, in closing is to pray for you. Uh, because I know many of you run a business. And uh, you, you know how COVID-19 has impacted you. And the economic disruption that comes with that. And what I'd like to do is pray a blessing for you that God will bless you and give you wisdom as you navigate the season. So may I pray for you? Let me pray for you as we close. Uh, loving God, I, I want to thank you for your, your wonderful faithfulness to your people and to those of us on this call. How you've guided and how you've equipped us to carry out the responsibilities you've placed in our hands. And, and I pray, Father, for each person on this call, for how they guide their business in the present, how they guide it toward the future. I pray for their family. I pray for their employees. I know they care about their employees. And I pray you will protect them and give them wisdom. Uh, loving God from the Old Testament, I pray these words that you will bless them. Will your face shine upon them? And will you give them peace as they courageously lead into the future? And I pray it in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.